Sophie. And when you're talking, I'm going to just swivel all the way around. Okay. <laughs> That's I'm going to be <laughs> swirling around. One and one, take one, A cam, B cam, C cam, Mark. Tom, welcome. Hello. How are Good you? to see you. Thanks for joining us well. to have this conversation. Uh, I think this is a topic maybe you have some familiarity with, free speech, expression, censorship. Uh, I'd like to go all the way back uh, to the beginning. You're wearing the Harlem hat. Tell me a little bit about uh, young Tom, childhood, and kind of encountering these ideas about expression and, and, and the idea that someone might want to shut down what someone else Sure, sure, sure. So uh, my mom was a single mom uh, with a half Kenyan child living in Harlem. Uh, I was, uh, we lived at 142nd in Riverside um, uh, in 1964, 65, uh, and then moved back to the small town in Illinois where I literally integrated the community of Libertyville, Illinois. So while the idea of First Amendment rights and free speech was not sort of first and foremost on my agenda as the only black kid in all white town, there were speech issues that arose on the on the playground at a very very early age, uh, where my point of view was forged with regards to issues of social justice, with regards to issues of right and wrong, with regards to the agency that one might have at any age of sort of affecting both their life, their future, and the community at large. I saw The Clash play in 1982 at the Aragon Ballroom in Chicago, wow. and there was, there was that, that feeling that you, you know, with metal and with pop and big rock bands of the 70s and, and 80s, that, that it was something to aspire to in these kind of gods who were mm -hmm. on stage, and they were a different species and a different kind of yes. being than, than you were. And in my basement, in my mom's basement, I had a little Music Man amp that was on a chair that, when I practiced with my band, right? Um, and I saw The Clash play at the Aragon Ballroom, and Joe Strummer, had the exact same Music Man amp on a chair at the Aragon. I'm not, I'm not kidding you. I yeah. couldn't believe it. Yeah. And it was like, it's not like, oh, one day I'm going to do this. It's like, we're both doing it. Like, he's doing it and I'm, like, there's, it's not some, something to aspire to. It's something that's already happening. Like, an, I'm an art, like, you don't, I'm an artist. Just like, like, I don't need that other stuff. It's just you have to make a, make a song and really mean it. And that seemed to be the common currency that was exposed by punk rock music, that you yeah. didn't need all these other trappings yeah. in order to make music that was important. And to think about how transformative and transcendental that Joe Strummer moment was for you. Yeah. yeah. And then to fast forward many years later when Rick Rubin's asking you, yeah. what, what was that story? Yeah, well, I got, to, I got to spend, you know, Joe, I could never, well, I did get to spend some time with Joe Strummer, right? Could never look at him as a peer, because, you know, he was, the, you know. Uh, but there was one afternoon where Rick Rubin called me up and he said, hey, I'm over here with Joe Strummer and Johnny Cash and we're recording Bob Marley's Redemption song. Would you like to play guitar? And I said, I'm busy. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, that's not what I said. I went right, right over and, you know, and so I did get to, I got to uh, play in a couple of records with Joe and it was pretty awesome. Incredible. Yeah. And yeah. so much, and so, and so many ends of the spectrum and so much about creativity and expression and yeah. all these things we're talking yeah. about encapsulated in that song and in those performers yeah. on that song yeah. yourself. And, and, and the Clash 2 were, were, um, really leads into sort of my first experience as an activist mm. and, you know, and, and confronting censorship. I was on the high school newspaper at Libertyville DOI, Drops of Ink, uh, and one day a fellow by the name of Dave Vogel came in with the London Calling record. And for the first time, I heard opinions on songs that I shared. This was a record that was talking about, you know, death squads in mm -hmm. Central America. At my high school paper, there were a couple of us that, that had similar points of view, and we wanted to write about death squads. We wanted to write about apartheid, and we wanted to especially write about the fact that the dean of students was a dick, and Drops of Ink was not going to Wanted, didn't want to hear any of those stories. They wanted to write about prom and about the football game. And so we would submit our stories and they would be rejected. So there was a mass exodus from the paper uh, and we formed an underground paper called the Student Pulse uh, wow. with, a, with a vendetta. So we wrote about <laughs> Central American death squads. We wrote about apartheid. Wow. We wrote a lot about how the dean of students was a dick. <laughs> and it, you know, of course it had four times the, you know, the, the reach of the, sure. of, the, of the high school rag. And they said, you can't pass it out in school. Like, you can't, you can't do that. And we were like, 
are you sure? And so we called the Chicago ACLU and we said, we're 16, 17 year old kids. We've got a newspaper. Uh, our school says we can't pass it out. Uh, can we? And they said, we'll be right over. With Rage Against Machine, we were not going to censor any of the lyrics of any of our songs for radio. So in the United States, the you couldn't play most of the songs on that record. Killing in the Name was the first single, um, and you couldn't play it here because it had 16 fuck yous and one motherfucker. Uh, meanwhile, in Europe, which M MTV and radio has sort of different stipulations, the band was blowing up, embarrassing the U.S. company here. Right. Second single was Bullet in the Head. It's got a bullet in your fucking head. That one's off. We're playing these huge festivals over here. We're opening up for House of Pain and small, cl you know, clubs in the U.S. Liquor store tour, I believe. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I believe we were on that one. Uh, something in shenanigans, shamrocks and shenanigans. Shamrock yeah, shenanigans. Yeah. Um, so the U.S. record company was embarrassed that they've got this band that is like a political Led Zeppelin public enemy yeah. thing yeah. that they can't, that nobody knows, that nobody knows yeah. about. And so it was, um, it was, you know, our. A and R person, who's a Michael Goldstone, who is a great proponent of the right way to do things, um, came to the band and said, "Look, we have nothing on MTV here. Like, there's no way to break the band with these songs with the curse words in it. So, how about this? What if the next single in the U.S. is a six and a half minute song with no chorus, and we give you guys whatever money you need to make a video to try to free Leonard Peltier?" Hmm. Like daring us to say no to that. Yeah. Like you can't say no to yeah. that. And we couldn't say no to that. So we said, that sounds great. So the song was Freedom, right? Yeah. Six and a half minutes long, there's no chorus. Um, but the secret underlying reason was because there are no curse words in the lyrics of that song. So they might be able to actually get it on MTV. So we make this very compelling video about and, the case. And there's text in the video. There's text in the video. It's to sort of let a new generation yeah. know and, you know, to try Viacom's to... Viacom's telling people about the American Indian movement. Exactly, exactly, <laughs> exactly, 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 exactly. Well, Viacom, so, so Viacom was this, this great evil overlord of censorship that got yeah. to, they watched every video and if they didn't like, you know, you, from your eyebrows to if something looked like a gun or whatever, they, they censored your video. So they were the ones that we had to get it by. So we make the video, it's fantastic. I'm watching the video in the back of the tour bus with our a and guy, and it goes, it goes by and he's like, what, what do you think? I'm like, we're doomed. He's like, what do you mean you're doomed? I said, because there's cursing in the video. He's like, there are, n let me tell you, we have had, you know, forensically gone through this video with all of our, you know, uh, litigation staff. I said, no, 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 no. It's not in the lyrics. It's an extemporaneous remark that Zach makes before the beat drop where he says, bring that shit in. And Michael's like, we're doomed. I'm like, well, <laughs> that is unless mm -hmm. he's not saying bring that shit in. What if he's saying bring the shatine? Shatine is the Aztec word for freedom. Wow. So what if we are bringing the shatine in then there's no cursing. A little, a little preview of People of the Sun. Now, <laughs> is Shatine the Aztec word for freedom? <laughs> as far as Viacom it, it knows is it now. is, <laughs> as far as Viacom knows it is, and that record got on MTV and we sold three million copies of that record and, and, in, and let an entirely new generation know about Leonard Peltier. <laughs> Incredible. <laughs> There was an organization called Parents Music Resource Center, the PMRC, which was some Washington senators' wives who were trying to clean up music or protect the youth. But let me tell you, whenever, whenever someone's trying to protect the youth, you know that there's an authoritarian jackass behind it. Um, so they feared that the rock and rap music and some of the, whether it's the sexual or devil imagery or violent imagery, was poisoning youth. They wanted to sticker albums, this, that, and the other. Rage was on Lollapalooza. 1993 were the opening acts and we decided that we wanted to take a stand against the PMRC like what could we do to make a point about censorship so our idea is this we're going to appear on stage butt ass naked with the letters PMRC written on our chest duct tape over our mouths guitars feeding back and then we're going to play no songs that's the show the point hopefully translating that you can't take for granted your ability to hear controversial music. Mm. That's not something that you can take for granted. Mm. So anyway, the only one who knew about it was our tour manager. And 
he had guessed that it would take 15 minutes for the cops to realize what was happening mm. and come and arrest the nude members of Rage Against the Machine. Mm. So there's a timer on stage. So Lane Staley, God rest his soul, the singer of, of Alice in Chains, yeah. they were like headlining. So he'd never seen us play because we played you know, six hours earlier. So that's, that's the, day. the day. That's the day. <laughs> that's the day that Lane came to the show. So Lane's sitting on the side of the stage and I'm sitting there you know, fully clothed before the show getting ready for, for our performance. And he's like, hey man, I hear you guys are great. I can't wait to see him. Like, oh, you're going to see us. All right, Lane, you're going to see us. So we're completely naked, PMRC on our chest, duct tape on. We stand there, guitars feeding back. Now, Lollapalooza is a phenomenon. There is rage against the machine with, you know, four guys, most of them fairly well hung, you know, and people are going absolutely bonkers. It's exciting. But then, you know, two minutes go by, three minutes go by. Five minutes go by, and it starts to get weird. and starts to feel... Because people maybe think, like, this is the intro. This is the intro. Yeah. Five minutes in, it's not the intro. <laughs> it's the show. <laughs> Between the five and ten minute mark, it's a standoff. Yeah. It's like people yeah. are now aware, uh-oh, like we just stepped in a pile of art or mm -hmm. something here. Mm -hmm. And this is, something. somebody's doing something to us now. <laughs> like, this, yeah. is, this is not entertainment. How do I mosh to this art? Exactly. This is not, this is not just a titillating, you know... Mm sock on your wiener deal yeah. like something's happening here we're standing there militant gaze guitars feeding back and then minutes 10 to 15 they're throwing quarters at our dicks like people are booing and yeah. like they're angry at what is happening and then we walk off stage and that's the show Lane's like, whoa. <laughs> like, so you guys do this every day? Right, right. Is this the show people have been talking about? What's the encore? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so there we are, we're running, and somehow, like, our clothes are, so I'm, I'm running around, and, and I, uh, I hid in the only place I thought that, like, a naked black man on an afternoon at a rock and roll concert, like, not seem out of place, and that was on the Fishbone tour bus, where they're just sitting there, they're just sitting there smoking weed watching Star Wars. <laughs> Cops knock at the door, like, what? <laughs> yeah, and you come on the Fishbone bus and they're just they're yeah, shrug totally shrugging. Yeah. Like, that's a Tuesday for them. Yeah. <laughs> that was the idea. You know, it was sort yeah. of using the platform to try to make... make uh, and the fact that the point. audience eventually turned and is you know, throwing yeah. quarters at you is, uh, speaks to the overall message, which was, well, this is what it's like if yes. we can't perform, Absolutely. If we can't speak, Absolutely. If we can't talk. Absolutely, you know? yeah. Well, Tom, thank you so much. Hey, thanks this very much for having me, man. It's an absolute joy. Thanks. Cheers. I think there's, there's only two positions on freedom of speech. You're for it or you're against it.